of course this is his first lecture as a finance minister of tamil nadu thank you sir for agreeing to do this despite the extremely busy schedule the topic of the lecture today is do freebies subsidies help or hinder growth successive dravidian governments in tamil nadu have got a lot of flack and bad press for the subsidies and welfare schemes and are often accused of fiscal profligacy in fact two judges at the madras high court earlier this year observed that the freebie culture was making the tamil people lazy and they wouldn't be surprised if migrants soon became the owners of properties in the state and the sons of the soil working under them but apart from such alarmist views uh, what really is the impact of giving subsidies and how do they affect economic growth who better than dr tyagarajan a former banker and a financial expert to booth to throw light on the topic uh, but before we start some ground rules uh, please keep your microphone muted during the talk and if you have any questions you can use your raise hand feature on the zoom window or send the questions across on chat and we will raise it uh, i now request acj bloomberg student kripa jayaraman to introduce dr tyagarajan to the audience over to you kripa um good evening all dr palnivel tyagarajan a two time mla from madurai is currently the minister for finance and human resources management in the tamil nadu government he did a chemical engineering degree from nit trichy a masters degree in operations research and a phd in human factors and engineering psychology from the state university of new york at buffalo he then went on to do an mba in finance from the prestigious mit sloan school of management while his career began in consulting he later moved to work as an investment banker in lehman brothers he quit the company as head of offshore capital markets in 2008 He soon moved to Standard Chartered Bank, where he worked as the managing director for global capital markets, followed by financial market sales. He quit the post in 2014. He moved back to India and then joined the DMK. He represents the fourth generation of his illustrious family's engagement with Dravidian movement. He is well known for articulating his thoughts simply and clearly, especially cutting down the financial jargon, which is the first thing we are taught here, and for his outspoken views on Twitter. The students of Asian College of Journalism welcome you, sir. Today's topic of discussion is: Do freebies or subsidies help or hinder growth? Over to you, sir. First of all, uh, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come back. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm not sure I want to be famous for my comments on Twitter, but I guess it is what it is. uh i'm uh, particularly happy to have this topic because i think it's something that is very uh, frequently either misunderstood or uh, uh confused uh, of course there's a whole different question about where the line between the executive the judiciary and the legislature ought to be drawn and whether these days we see that line being incre- increasingly blurred or non existent but that's another topic for another day if i just go back to uh, the topic given to me why don't we start with uh, at least my understanding of the basic role of government in a civilized society in a democracy uh, in a republic what is the economic kind of uh, role of a government because surely uh, nobody has ever said you know governments uh, are the greatest creator of jobs or you know the greatest drivers of an economy unless you're norway or Brunei or Saudi Arabia where you're getting it out of the ground and therefore the people's assets uh, drive the economy uh you know the rest of the time the government is not the primary driver of economic activity people are businesses are individuals are so in the simplest sense i would say the job of government in a democracy is really three or four basic things one to raise revenues from the people in an equitable and fair manner in fact our uh, economic advisory council member uh, dr s narayan former finance secretary of india has said that that really has been seen as the primary role of government uh, stretching back uh, to the artha shastra in our culture that it's really about raising money in a fair and equitable manner and uh, the optimum amount of it. but what do we raise the money for then really the second job is to ensure that you provide high quality public goods and services as universally as possible you know drinking water transportation education healthcare um you know access to opportunity uh, i would go so far as to say the next role which most countries explicitly take on is 
to ensure that there is a level playing field and to create the environment for growth. So to ensure that uh, the few don't kind of corner the assets, even in capitalism, as our other economic advisor, Raghuram Rajan, uh, once wrote in a book, saving capitalism from the capitalists. Don't let the winners get so strong and so big that they can basically uh, take control of the system. So ensuring a level playing field and uh, creating the kind of ecosystem for growth, you know, a good uh, uh, dispute resolution system, strong property rights, uh, good infrastructure that allows private enterprise to come and create growth. And crucially, to provide some protection or support for the poorest, the weakest, the most unfortunate, the most uh, kind of bottom of the, of the economic or other spectrum in a society. A caring and compassionate society is defined by how well you take care of those most in need, not who gets to be rich or how many get to be rich. So in that sense, uh, you know, some of us uh, uh, only may need help temporarily. It may be unemployment insurance. It may be health care that one cannot afford and the state must provide. Some may need it for longer durations because of, a, you know, disability or a differently able person. Uh, but the net result is that all civilized societies have some sort of a safety net uh, to provide for those who are in need, either instantaneously or over longer durations uh, of time. In that sense, uh, when we think of subsidies or, or freebies, really we are talking about that component of it, of what is the role of the government in taking care of people and how do we define uh, you know, where the right line is? Because I think for most of us, uh, this is not a black or white situation and I'll explain in, in some detail. So first let me say that of course we can separate subsidies and freebies very clearly. Right? A subsidy is something that is used on a sliding scale. It doesn't have to be the same for all. Uh, by definition of freebie, which itself is a bad term, but the definition of freebie, free of cost, is free of cost. It's zero. There's not some people zero and some people 10. That's not a, a, a free of cost. Whereas a subsidy can be some people get 10%, some people 20, some people 15, some people 25. And it is really an incentive alignment or behavior uh, incentivizing kind of tool. So subsidies are used around the world uh, for things like, uh, you know, um, import substitution. The country decides we no longer want to import this particular type of product. We need to be self-reliant or at least have 50% production. Therefore, we provide subsidies who make uh, to those who make this product. It can be for export promotion. In our country, we provide a lot of subsidies and benefits to people, uh, particularly when we were not as strong in uh, foreign exchange reserves to those who would do uh, exports and, and earn uh, foreign exchange for us. Uh, most states and the union government provide subsidies to entrepreneurs, to small business owners, to people who, um, who create jobs, uh, to people who innovate, for people who, who do startups. So uh, a subsidy is more of an incentive alignment or an incentive uh, creation mechanism, and it can be on a sliding scale. By contrast, a freebie is effectively free of cost. Now, freebie is probably, as I say, a bad term, but let's just say, you know, services without any payment. Every society in the world, every society in the world, bar none, provides something free of payment, right? Whether it's education, whether it's drinking water, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, basic health care of some minimum sort or, or emergency. And, and really, it's a question of degree to who gives what. And I, and I made the point somewhere else that I'll make here again. There is very little correlation between a country's average GDP or per capita GDP and whether that country has poor people or not. Because there's another dimension to societies, which is the, in, the, the higher or lower inequality built into the society. I'll give you a couple of examples. So the U.S. is one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, you know, has very high per capita income, somewhere around fifty, fifty-two thousand uh, dollars per person. But does that mean that there are no poor people in the U.S.? Of course not. There are so many people who the government of either the state or the federal government provides things like food stamps, meaning they otherwise would not have enough to eat. So, <laughs> excuse me. So even in the richest societies, there are still people getting uh, government assistance to ensure that they have food, their children have food. 
uh, in the US, in the income tax system, there's something called earned income credit. People who earn so little that the government uses the mechanism to pay them back and has them file a return, not because they have to pay any tax, but so they can get a refund, uh, you know, so-called refund uh, for in, uh, credit they would have otherwise, uh, income they would have otherwise earned. So every society in the world has some people that need help and uh, the rich doesn't uh, change that. Okay, let's go within India. A state like Gujarat has a, a slightly higher per capita income than a state like Tamil Nadu. However, if you look at either the per capita consumption or the Gini coefficient or the access to health care or the average education or the percentage of girls below 15 who are enrolled in school full time, there is no comparison. Tamil Nadu is much, much better off in all of those dimensions. It is fundamentally a more equitable society. And that is despite being 10 or 20,000 rupees out of a 2 lakh 30,000 or whatever uh, per capita income variation to, um, to uh, Gujarat or lower that. So, you know, the real question then is not, is there or isn't there or should there or should there not be? Of course, every society has some. Really, the two things we should talk about is what kind of free of cost service or product and how is it administered? And that really will be the question whether we think, you know, the real uh, debate would be, in theory, if you were spending money without getting the right outcome for it, then it, it, it hurts growth because I'll give you some examples, but really you could be not just squandering away the public money, but you, be, you could be creating problems yourself. Uh, as, you know, maybe uh, observed, uh, you know, without comment by, uh, by somebody earlier, that uh, in theory, you could be disincentivizing people from doing real work uh, or, or, you know, uh, somehow creating some new issues. Um, the, uh, um, the other extreme is that surely nobody would advocate that we don't provide education for free. Nobody would advocate that we don't provide at least vaccinations for free. I mean, these are all things that uh, is not in the realm of discussion for most reasonable people. So I have uh, picked up about five or six, I've just written myself a little note, examples of what others would consider freebies. Uh, and the first problem arises, of course, by what is the definition of a freebie? You know, one man's uh, kind of fundamental service or provision of subsidy uh, or uh, essential uh, uh, facet of civilized society can easily be called another man's freebie. I made this point to the 15th Finance Commission, whose terms of reference included, uh, believe it or not, a clause that said that uh, 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 states which do a lot of populist spending shall be given a lower allocation of tax funds. So I asked the question, how do you define what is populist? Who is an, uh, who is an authority? Who has got the definition uh, you know, from, uh, from God or from nature to say what is populist or what is not populist. Is a subsidy for gas cylinders that was given by the union government with the face of the prime minister, is that considered populist? If that is not populist, why should the government of Tamil Nadu uh, giving subsidies or giving free laptops and cycles to students who are studying be considered populist? So, you know, at some level, all these terms are meaningless and surely uh, they're subjective. But let me give you some examples and we'll, we'll see whether that makes sense. So uh, clearly some things that we consider revenue spending or providing free service or free goods to people, particularly the examples I've given, the free noon meal scheme. Tamil Nadu is a pioneer, started in 1921 with the Justice Party government of Madras Corporation providing free breakfast, got expanded uh, multiple people multiple times. The great uh, second great expansion came with the Kamraj who expanded to lunch at all schools, but only for poor students. The third big expansion came with the MGR, who expanded all students at school irrespective of any means testing for whether they needed it or not. And then, of course, Kalinger, who expanded it to protein to include eggs and so forth. Every one of those interventions have fundamentally strengthened and improved our society and, uh, you know, made the next generation better equipped to deal with the world than the one before it. And so I, I would consider that essential investment in the human resources of our state. And in no way would that be considered either populist or, you know, freebie. Uh, different people at different times have provided uh, uh, cycles to high school students, to lap laptops, to college-going students, all of which, again, I see 
that though it's revenue spending for us, in fact, let me put it another way. Were the government to purchase cycles or laptops, we would consider that capital spending because we're acquiring a good that will depreciate over time. But since we buy it and give it to other people, we consider that revenue spending. But those people are the people for whom the government runs. So it's very easy to justify those as investments in the future. They increase the productivity, the access to education, uh, you know, the, the time spent on studying versus other things. Uh, we can even look at subsidies that are somewhat unique to Tamil Nadu, like support for weddings, like the Tangam Fatali scheme, or, or uh, what we recently did. Uh, the government of Tamil Nadu is fairly, uh, I would say, uh, best in the country, but fairly generous relative to other states, support schemes for expect expectant mothers. Not only do we provide uh, vitamins and nutrition and, and nutrition and counseling and, and all kinds of other things, but also cash assistance uh, for every expectant mother. We can look at schemes like health insurance and crop insurance, which in some cases we charge notional amounts. For many cases, we don't charge anything at all. Uh, we use the insurance model just to ensure that only those that really need it get it and that there's some ceiling on the per person utilization. But really, it is a way of the government protecting uh, the public from uh, bad outcomes, uh, uh, you know, risk that they couldn't otherwise mitigate themselves. Then you have things like National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. Again, one of our financial advisors, Professor Jean Dres, had a big hand in the creation of that. And even in our recent meeting, of the Tamil Nadu Economic Advisory Council, the Chief Minister and the advisors discussed about our commitment to provide a thousand rupee uh, per woman uh, household member a subsidy and how soon we could get to implementing that. Now, the MNREGA is a perfect example. If you take the MNREGA uh, and you think of it as a kind of minimum employment or minimum income, uh, basic income guarantee scheme, scheme quasi, then there's two ways of implementing this. One is to implement it in a way that people actually do some work. And there's so much work to be done. There's all these ponds and then columns to be, uh, you know, desilted, to be rejuvenated. There's, uh, um, you know, uh, work on uh, roads to be done. There's buildings to be built, uh, schools to be built. There's uh, community centers to be built. So as someone who signs off on these uh, files as a finance minister, I see so many projects and so many initiatives for which uh, the labor can be achieved through the employment guarantee scheme. And that is really a win-win, right? We get the work done, we get some output for it, there's increase in productivity and people who otherwise were not in the workforce are engaged in the workforce, raises the overall productivity of the state collectively and ensures that they have basic income which they otherwise would not have. Now, you could also see in many cases the, the, the allegation, at least, I'm not sure who's tracking these cases, but uh, of money being given with no work being done or money being given to phantom workers or money being given and that disrupting the local economy. And this I've heard many times where people say, well, if you go to a village and you pay uh, individuals 150 rupees a day and don't extract any work from them, then really you're making the next best option, which is to work for uh, the farm sector uh, uh, worth something like 300 rupees. So what you've done is you've just increased the wages that, that the farm sector faces. And if you do that, you have two, three basic problems. The first problem is that you have increased the input cost to the farmer. The second is that will reflect in, in you know, increased food prices uh, at, the, at the retail. But most of all, you have effectively created inflation. You know, you have pumped more money into the system without getting more goods. And that is the technical kind of methodology for increasing inflation is more money chasing the same of your goods. So, uh, you know, like with many other schemes, it's really the execution, the implementation and the context. And I'll get into that in a, in a, in a or let me just actually go aside here for a second. Surely all these concerns I have about MNREGA, about whether it causes real work and all that, is much more of, of, uh, of uh, concern or much greater value when we are in a tight economy and the labor market is tight or where there's you know, kind of uh, uh, already a full employment and things like that. I really don't worry about any of these things if we are in a pandemic and the economy is in a huge slump and people are having a hard time finding a way to make a living then, of course, all these norms don't apply. Then I say, please give the money as fast as you can to as many people as you can, because that's how you stimulate demand and keep people out of poverty. 
So, you know, many of these things are also a grayscale in terms of uh, what context, what part of the economic cycle, uh, you know, are you in a disaster situation? Are you in a regular situation? Are you a $5,000 per capita country? Are you a $50,000 per capita country? Are you in a tight labor market? Are you in a slack labor market? Is inflation under control? Is inflation already soaring? All these things, of course, will determine, you know, the relative value and the relative stringency with which you should enforce these kinds of things. Then you start getting into really, really difficult things, which is, you know, I can't uh, uh, tell you how many audit reports have come back about the problems with implementing the free uh, cow and goat scheme. A little less on the goats, but increased, uh, you know, extreme number of problems with the free cow scheme. I mean, those of you who have, who have looked into it, the complexity of it is horrendous, right? So in theory, the idea is good. You give uh, women, especially rural women who have land and who have access to cattle feed type areas, vegetation, a cow, and you make them milk producers, you increase the total output of the, of the state, uh, you give them a revenue and so forth and so forth. You get, they get cow dung and, and all these things. The problem is, if you buy those cows inside the state and you move them from one hand to another within a tight uh, circle, A, you're driving up the price of cows because you've got more money chasing the same number of cows. B, you know, because you're not getting uh, breeding uh, of genetic pools that are different, you could increase a lot of internal problems. So the design of the program, I don't know, through whatever iteration, said you really have to get the cows from outside the state. Now the question is, who gets to decide which cow is worth buying and bringing and giving to which beneficiary? So then the program is designed to say, no, no, the government cannot buy the cow. The beneficiary must go to the next state and with the government uh, kind of purchasing uh, uh, authorized person and then buy the cow there and bring it back. They say, which cow? Oh, no, no, no. You must go and test the milking of the cow for four days to make sure it milks to a certain capacity. And then you must bring it back. Now, which cattle market in Andhra or Karnataka is going to allow somebody to test a cow's milking uh, production for four days? So, you know, this, this scheme has inherently got structural problems that were not thought through. And though it is supposed to have been in execution, it has failed in so many ways because it has got, uh, you know, well, many ways to fail. It has not been well thought through. And then you look at things that are even worse. I mean, you look at things like, uh, you know, now well past needs into wants, into grinders and mixies and fans and all that. And you start asking yourself, you know, when somebody can walk down the street in most parts of uh, uh, society, uh, most villages even, and buy uh, ground dosa batter or idli batter for five rupees in packets, uh, are you really going to, you know, uh, do that much better than having your own mixers and grinders? And especially, sorry, somebody's not muted, I think. Uh, especially at a, at a state uh, where not everybody has continuous supply of power and where energy is already subsidized only up to 100 units. So were I to give a lot of free goods like fans and, and mixes grinders and uh, the latest one, our opponents put our washing machines, uh, then really you know, you'd, you'd be creating multiple uh, problems by yourself. Uh, the washing machine uh, thing really gave me a laugh because, uh, you know, 90% of the households, even in big cities like uh, Madurai, don't have continuous running water, right? Uh, there's some structural problems we're trying to fix, but certainly in the rural areas, you don't have con continuous running water. And as, as anybody who's ever had a washing machine knows, it's very hard to run a washing machine unless it has a pipeline of water. Uh, and then, of course, I would say egregiously bad schemes like giving 50% uh, uh, subsidy to scooters, one lakh scooters or bikes a year, which is bad for the environment, bad for the traffic, uh, you know, increases your dependency on, uh, on um, uh, petrol and diesel, or petrol in this case, and uh, further tarnishes the demand for bus service and so forth. So, you know, it's unjustifiable unjust in most ways. So... If I put all of this together, I would say that really uh, there are no black and white answers here. It depends, of course, on the many variables that I've said. But I'll go one step further. I'll say at the end of the day, the execution is probably the most important aspect. You know, it's one thing to say I have or I don't have a plan. It's another, you know, another thing to say is well-designed, not well-designed. But if you don't have 
fundamentally good systems, good data, and therefore good execution, then everything else is irrelevant, right? A, a bad scheme can be redeemed through good data and good execution. A good scheme can be ruined through bad data and bad execution. And, uh, you know, I, I have been very clear to my uh, chief minister and to many of the authorities I work with the IS offices that in my mind, um, you know, giving an undeserved benefit to somebody is marginally less bad than having somebody who doesn't get what they should get from the state. But giving something to somebody who has gamed the system to extract that benefit is infinitely worse. And in many cases, we can judge the intent. Let me give you two or three examples. Um, one of the five pillars that I talked about after we came to power and that I've kept on repeating about how we're going to improve the administration and, and governance is a data-centric uh, uh, governance model. And what does that mean? That we want to know who's who. We want to know who gets what. We want to know who's eligible for what. We want to know how many points somebody touches the government uh, are the same people who are in the uh, kind of free rice category also uh, paying income tax, for example, right? I mean, just these are two incongruous things. So uh, we started some work. Uh, I think we came to office in May. Between May and June, we were mostly tied up with the second wave of COVID. We probably started uh, real governance work in July. Uh, and I think around the middle or end of July, we announced this initiative. So it's been about two and a half, three months that we've been looking at the data. And just to give you two or three examples, the crop loan waiver that our predecessors did before we came, at least 50, 60% of the records had serious problems with them. The most egregious uh, uh, example that I listed in the assembly during my budget uh, speech was uh, an individual who had given uh, uh, detail for a, a crop they had planted, taken a loan, and then had it waived, except the land that they talked about was inside a government arts college owned by the government and not arable. It was not cultivable land. And yet that loan was also waived. And uh, in real time, we have now been processing the, the dual loan waiver that my uh, chief minister announced when he was uh, leader of the opposition and during the campaign. And as he has pointed out himself, uh, after we have been able to cross-reference the data, we have found that uh, almost two-thirds of the loans were gamed by people, uh, individuals who applied at six different places, uh, more than a lack of covers of so-called jewels pledged to get loans, empty covers, never had jewels in them in the first place. So, you know, the extreme examples, extreme examples of, uh, of uh, malfeasance uh, are just uh, uh, mind-boggling, but it tells you the value of data and the value of connectivity and the value of cross-reference and put all together the value of execution. So, for example, we uh, created some new rules on this uh, dual loan waiver. A, that it can only be given to people who identify themselves with the physical ID and match in the face and be only to them in person and see with an auditor of the cooperative societies which sits under finance present, and those auditors we're giving special training, and then we're crossing them across districts so that they don't have collusion. So we'll send the auditor from Chennai district to Madurai district to validate, or uh, something to that effect, not particularly those two districts, but cross districts. So at the end of the day, I would say, uh, you know, before we look at this as too theoretical a question, maybe it's worth looking around the world. And we look around the world, and as I've said many times before, there's a very strong correlation between compassionate societies, between those that protect the weakest, uh, the most in need, and the quality of life of citizens, the, not just the economic development, but the overall social development, and the Gini coefficient, how unequal uh, a society is or isn't. And, and I give examples at a global level, if you compare places like Scandinavia, uh, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, all relatively uh, high tax, high benefit, free education, you know, free maternity leave, uh, free healthcare, um, better quality of life countries. You compare those to, you know, even a country like the US, the quality of life doesn't quite match. And then within the U.S., you take states like California, New York, Minnesota that have very good protections, relatively speaking, 
for the poorest and weakest, and you can see where they start to separate from uh, the not so progressive or not so compassionate states. And I've already made the mention within India, certainly of the four large rich states in India of uh, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Gujarat, Tamil Nadu stands in its, uh, on its own in terms of the uh, relative development across both economic and social uh, indicators taken together, doctors per thousand people, infant mortality, maternal mortality, uh, girls enrolled in education, um, access to uh, healthcare, uh, doctors per thousand people, uh, percentage of sanitization, percentage of urbanization, any of these measures you take, we stand uh, in, a, in a separate place by ourselves. And surely that has something to do with being a society that has worked consciously for inclusion, uh, for ensuring that the boredom is protected. It comes at a cost, nothing comes free, right? I mean, surely there are uh, many things that are wasted. Surely if we spend money, uh, some of the time it goes to the wrong places, sometimes unconsciously, sometimes consciously. We are just doing an exercise now where some preliminary data has come in that many, many people, many thousands of people who are uh, listed as uh, having expired in the, in the civil register are still listed as receiving pension benefits in the government's pension systems, the monthly thousand rupees. So on the one hand, you know, that's not good. We can correct it. On the other hand, there are also moral questions. If thousand rupees a month was what we considered the kind of living sustenance amount of money to be given to a widow or a differently able person back in 2011, then is it a fair and just society that still only provides thousand rupees a month in 2021? Should that number have been significantly increased? And why has it not? So, you know, uh, as with other things in life, there are uh, relatively few uh, black and white answers. Uh, everything has nuance, uh, execution, administration, governance is as important as philosophy, planning, policy. Uh, but I think overall, uh, the state of Tamil Nadu has benefited from a particular and unique approach it has taken. And certainly the chief minister has no intention of uh, moving away from this model. If anything, probably we will expand on it, but with better data, with better integration, with better execution, with better checks and balances. And, and that's, uh, you know, uh, that part is black and white for us. We have no doubt about it. Uh, why don't I stop now? I've been speaking for about 35 minutes and then maybe I can take questions that might be of greater value uh, yeah, sure. to the audience. Any questions? Uh, yeah, Gokul, go ahead. Hi, sir. Good evening. I just want to know, like, when you have schemes like these, are there metrics that you look at to see whether they have been successful in the sense that if you are giving out the gold, is there any metric that you look at? Or for example, you mentioned cycles, they, uh, act, they increase access to education. So do you look at those metrics to see whether it has been successful or what are the metrics that you use <coughs> your team has been successful? Yeah, I mean, some of these are easier to track than others, as you might imagine. Um, and some of these, we are not the, you know, a lot of the information is public. So it's not like we are working with hidden data, right? So if you look at either enrollment levels or if you look at graduation levels or if you look at, um, you know, um, bank credit levels, or if you look at, uh, you know, number of complaints against usury or so forth. I'm not saying we're great, but almost all these statistics are either tracked by us. We have incidentally in, in, in one of the departments, um, I, uh, I, uh, the chief minister has asked me to look after, it's called uh, planning and development. In that we have a data and analytics uh, department which does this, it goes and checks the effectiveness of programs, it checks whether they reached, it checks the consequences, so forth. Uh, if I was to tell you the truth, I'd say that is not used as much as it should have been in the past. A guy like me who came from a trading desk and who lives on data, then you know I, I lever up on it a lot more. But at some level, it's not the only benchmark, right? I mean, the, the outcomes of society are there for all to see. And were we really uh, spending a lot of money without getting a lot of good, not only would we realize it uh, uh, statistically, but we'd realize it politically because, you know, we're still a growing country. We're still a zero-sum game. So were we spending a lot of money in the wrong place, then surely the people would have felt the void of it in the right place. So there's some inherent systemic checks and balances. 
we do have professional kind of uh, day jobs that are supposed to be looking at this uh, they have been doing some of it in the past i i suspect they are doing more of it now after i took the portfolio than ever before and then we'll do a lot more of it still uh, partly internally partly with partners like the poverty action lab at uh, at mit where uh, one of our other uh, economic advisors uh, professor esther duflo uh, is uh, is heading the the asia initiative and uh, and civil society right i mean uh, other people look at things like that anjik go ahead with your question uh, so i have two questions so uh, firstly uh, like uh, while the success of several of the social justice schemes uh, is out in the open and uh, like it's visible but then uh, like over time and over the years uh, it is it it's become a very common visual that several of these social justice measures are used as tools uh, by political parties to lure voters so uh, how do we uh, like uh, prevent something like that from happening uh, like as a just as a tool and the second one is that uh, your party in its manifesto had promised a 1000 rupee allowance uh, to women head of uh, households uh so while you have fulfilled the uh, promise of uh, increasing maternity leaves um, for women uh, how do you plan to finance uh, this uh, measure uh, which is like given the situation of covid and piling debts debts in the state yeah i think the first is that uh, we are very clear that if a, if a program works well we should find that fewer and fewer people need it and that's the whole point we're lifting people out of this uh, system and our data as a percentage of society certainly shows that and will continue to show that i think if you say will politicians use it as uh, as a kind of uh, vote catchers look uh, politicians come from society right we don't uh, fall from the sky we're not dug up from the ground we reflect society and our job is to align ourselves to society uh in some rare instances we expect to lead society to where it needs to go even if it doesn't want to go but most of the time politicians are not that kind of uh, you know we want to carve out the new world and all that most of the time politicians want to kind of uh, keep a little bit ahead of a little bit behind the society is yes. uh i think the the more developed a society becomes its aspirations change a lot i think the days in tamil nadu where you could just simply win by promising this freebie or that freebie or more of the same i i think those days are behind us i think you have to say something of substance um you know we are we are measuring all the time and i would say for example that uh we have gotten more traction with the public for example on the marginal reduction in petrol tax than probably some of these non waivers that we have done that just goes to tell you that some things are universal and a that people understand that these things have also a multiplier effect and a prospective effect as opposed to much uh, much less in other things uh as far as the 1000 rupees goes uh, initially that was only part of the chief minister's 10 year vision that we would get there within the next 10 years rather than any given date uh, as with any other party these manifestos don't come and say by this date by this date by this date I must confess that my understanding of Indian politics was uh, a that these manifestos were not particularly well developed or well written is not like the party conferences held and 5000 people get input into this you know these documents uh, emerge through some process um, I haven't changed my mind I- I'm not sure these manifestos are phenomenally uh, well planned or uh, immensely uh, kind of uh, internally debated outcomes having said that I have also been shocked at how focused my chief minister is on delivering these you know and I I I don't mind confessing that I've had conversations with him and with others and say listen so many parties just uh, give their manifestos and don't do anything if you look at the our predecessors in 2016 they won the election of the state not having delivered any fraction of what they had uh, promised in 2011 if you look at the union government in 2019 you know where were the two crore jobs where was all the black money brought back where was all the stuff nothing happened and they came back to power so it's not even clear to me that people really believe you when you say that having said that i'm still shocked every day the chief minister tells us where are we on this where are we on this where are we on this and we translated the bulk of those 500 something commitments into actionable items uh, for the different departments allocated them ministers so forth 
And I must say that it was beyond my wildest expectation that we would deliver on 200 and something of them within six months of taking office, because certainly many of them have such great costs and such great uh, uh, groundwork required that it's not realistic to get that done all within you know, any short time. But as far as a thousand rupees go, um, the first thing we're finding out, and really it was on the discussion just to see how, show how important it is, it was on the discussion with our global economic advisors at the second economic advisory council meeting that happened on Monday night, about 48 hours ago now, uh, and extensively. And Professor John Reyes has uh, wrote a note before it and wrote a note after it, and I'm looking at some of the data so forth. So really, um, it's, not, it's not that complicated or that um, astronomical in size. It could be up to two crore families. Uh, Tamil Nadu's population is such that there's, you know, we can use electricity meter connections, we can use ration cards, we can use water databases. Whichever way you look at it, there's about two pro families. My best guess is that, uh, you know, certainly families like mine don't need it. So if we start moving up and down the spectrum in a, in a state with a two lakh, I don't know, 40,000 or something per capita income, which is uh, 20,000 rupees a month and a fairly low Gini coefficient, meaning a much more uh, homogenized and much less stratified society compared to, let's say, Gujarat or Maharashtra or Karnataka, uh, certainly compared to UP or Bihar, then maybe the numbers are not as we thought. It's not like two crore people or two crore women should get the money. It's probably in the tens of lakhs. And that's what our data is showing us. And then you multiply that by 12,000 rupees a year. And it's not actually, I mean, it's a big number by any stretch, but given the scale of Tamil Nadu's economy and the scale of our budget this year, you know, I presented a budget to the assembly, I think it was 3,55,000 something crores uh, and uh, estimated a GSDP of 21,36,000 crores or so. So, you know, uh, a 12 or 15 or 18,000 crore is not an overwhelming number. I personally am much, much more concerned that we should know who is who. We should have a family portrait of every portrait. We should find out who's benefiting from what schemes. We should find out who needs what help more than other help. And we should find out, therefore, to get this money into the hands of people for whom it would make a difference. Uh, that's what I say about everything. But I say that more uh, specifically about this one or more vigorously about this one than any other. And I think these are all things that we can um, we can do reasonably. You know, we are, we are a big state. Uh, you know, we're going to start uh, announcing some of the things we have done and some of the things we have discovered. And uh, while it's a very difficult time, based on many years of mismanagement, plus a demonetization, plus a, a, a pandemic, uh, we have borne it better than others. Right? Uh, all all crises exacerbate inequality. Uh, and that was true of both demonetization and um, and the pandemic. Tamil Nadu suffered much less than the Indian average or than poor states did. And so our ability to bounce back and get back to a relatively uh, good trajectory is probably better than most. And so I, I'm not overly concerned about the time. Uh, the chief minister would like it done yesterday. So we work within that time frame, but we'll get it done sooner rather than later. And the money is not my biggest concern. The data, the execution, the, the fairness, the model uh, is much more um, my concern. Anjali. Uh, hello, sir. So, so my question is about the white paper that was released a few months ago. So in that, it's mentioned that the subsidies have reached the level of 27.6% of the revenue expenditure. And there's a line that says that uh, the urgent measures for improving, targeting, and reorientation of subsidies. So, so my question is, could you elaborate on what exactly is meant by reorientation of subsidies and whether it could potentially affect the existing subsidies? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, we, uh, our, as I said, right, the philosophy is very clear. We want to make sure that those who need it, get it. We want to make sure that those who don't need it, don't get it. And most of all, we want to make sure that those who gain the system don't get it at all. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on the electricity front because that's really where the, uh, the bulk of our uh, immediate concerns are. And we lose about, on average, two or three rupees a unit 
uh, for every unit of electricity concerned. We lose about 60 rupees a kilometer for every transport, public transport bus that uh, travels. So these are not sustainable models. So when we go and break it down, you know, we start to see some very clear things that this is more inertia and kind of um, lack of, uh, of application of mind than anything else. If we look at the EB subsidy, for example, of the annual subsidy of effectively, or the, the loss, let's call it. I, won't, I don't know what part is subsidy, what part is not. But of the annual loss of 30 something thousand crores, uh, you know, within the retail sector, uh, is about 20,000 crores or so within what we consider free electricity to uh, uh, to uh, agriculture, but actually includes a lot of line loss and a lot of theft. I mean, in Thani, uh, in Thani district in the Kambam Valley, I personally have highlighted a lot of instances and an affidavit has been filed by the PWD that something like 24,000 horsepower of uh, unapproved or beyond the norms uh, motors are being run. That's about 40, 45 lakhs a day of, uh, of um, you know, free electricity going to the wrong people uh, who are stealing water using the free electricity. So it's like we are enabling the criminal behavior uh, at a greater cost to ourselves. So even within, then we start breaking down, even within the residential sector, the bulk of the kind of 100 free units um, benefit goes to people uh, who use more than 500 units of electricity. So, you know, once you start going for these kind of blanket subsidies or blanket uh, uh, free items, in some cases, they're very targeted uh, because we have a social justice agenda. You know, as the uh, chief minister says, all women will travel free because he wants to ensure that women have access to go to work and get out of the house. But if you look at it from a different perspective, it's not clear that we should keep, uh, uh, let's say, bus charges at the lowest level possible because we're catering then to the people who make 5,000, 8,000 domestic work, low end of the pyramid. Surely there are also people who earn 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 rupees who bear on a bus and they're still buying tickets at the level we intended for the 3,000 or 5,000. So in the white paper, we have pointed out several anomalies without elaborating too much about them, but we think people will read into the lines in the transport corporations before we ever consider paying for diesel or the depreciation of the bus or anything for one rupee of revenue, we're paying one and a half rupees of wages. No, no business in the world will run like that. Even if you see it as a service, I have no problem. You know, in many countries, they provide uh, free transportation to the weakest sections of society. In many other countries, you have a card, like in Hong Kong, you have a octopus card that basically the government knows who you are and the rate at which you pay is based on whether you're a student or a retiree or a normal working person or poor and deserve subsidies, et cetera. So, you know, there are so many models around the world. And so we are trying to find that balance that uh, uh, our value system of economic inclusion and justice, justice meaning we give free to those who can not afford to pay and we charge to those who can afford to pay. How do we implement those in a way that uh, these models work out and uh, uh, it's doable, right? The math is in the, in the right place. Uh, so far, what we have seen, of course, it's a sea change. So it will require uh, some, um, uh, some political will uh, because, you know, but part of that is changing the debate. Part of that is uh, getting society involved in the debate. So well, one of the main functions I see is uh, making things transparent, making things easily understandable and getting them out into debate. And by debate, of course, we, we care about journalists and the students at the ACJ, but we care also about the tea shops, the bus stands, the farms. We want people to talk about what kind of society do we want to be and what, what should the government do that is fair and right. And, uh, you know, this helps us uh, as we get feedback on what should be our priorities and how we should drive this. Uh, so my second question uh, is about, the white paper also mentions that there was an irresponsible degradation of financial status of local bodies in the last five years and must be corrected at once. So, so what are the steps that the government plans to take to correct the degradation? Well, um, you know, 
there's on both sides, right? One is on the uh, income side and one is on the expense side. If you look on the income side, property tax rates have not been raised in 10 or 12 years. And, um, you know, we are not the only state in India. We're not the only kind of uh, big metropolis in Chennai. So you compare Chennai to Bangalore, you look at Tamil Nadu property tax rates compared to other, other states' property tax rates. And we are way behind because we haven't raised them in eight years. So on the revenue side, this, the, the local bodies have become, you know, much, much more dependent on state aid and are not raising their own revenues properly and they need to fix them. On the expense side, uh, A, they have been a bit profligate for the sake of corruption in many cases, as I've said. For example, I was in a meeting earlier today. Almost everywhere else in the world, the smart city scheme, which is a joint union and state scheme, required the increase in uh, uh, monitoring, increase in CCTV camera, cameras, improving uh, risk management, crime control. Uh, you know, uh, In Chennai, for example, the cameras monitor the trash bins. And when they get close to fill, then you know it's time for them to be picked up and taken out or they put sensors in the trash. In Madurai, zero of the 1,000 crores or 1,200 crores allocated was spent on any of these things. It just went to tenders that could be given margins to the uh, ministers uh, for them to make money. So, you know, these things are, uh, are gaps in, in capability that we have to get back. Uh, if I focus on Madurai for, uh, for another minute, I'll say, uh, you know, lots of bills have not been paid. The, the local bodies owe hundreds, if not thousands of crores to uh, the Tamil Nadu Water Administration Department as well as to the Tamil Nadu Electricity Department. Uh, these are not uh, acceptable kind of uh, balances and, and shirking of payments. Um, also in Madurai, for example, many of these projects have created worse problems than if they did not exist. In my constituency, there are two major construction projects that are done. Uh, and one of them has uh, parking spaces for 1,100 bikes and 110 cars. The other one has parking spaces for 400 and something bikes and 40 something cars. None of these has been assessed in terms of what the traffic flow into the single ramp parking garages would do to the traffic of the area. I am really worried about how we'll get the cars in and out of the bikes in and out of these places. And, uh, you know, uh, the complexities and the traffic jams that will arise from trying to bottleneck this many vehicles into this small, uh, uh, into one ramp and one lane. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that are irresponsible. Of course, they have to get their fiscal balance right. They have to first raise their revenues. Then they have to pay uh, all the dues that they have. They need to be much more. Uh, competent. Part of the problem was that there was no local body elections for the last five years, right? So the the the, uh, the villages, at least, they ran it like six months before this election, but the before the main election. But the cities and the towns and the and the municipalities, uh, we have not had uh, local councillors for um, uh, um, you know since 2016. So it's you know if. So that's what democracy is supposed to do. You're supposed to have locally elected officials who are worried to go back and tell their voters why they allow stuff like this to happen. Then they will act. But if you don't have any elected official and the last, uh, you know, the first port of call is the last man in the hierarchy who's the minister for municipal administration sitting in Delhi who's impervious to any kind of intrusion, then they'll do whatever they want. And that's what has happened. Dima. Good evening, sir. So my question is regarding how political parties and politicians think. So our democracy de is designed in a way that incentives of political parties um, is, is in the short run, right? Because, you know, if there's a five year life cycle, elections happen every five years. And usually welfare schemes are designed to, you know, uh, for five years to get the returns in five years. Whereas education and healthcare uh, are sectors when you invest in them, you know, it usually the, the returns are long drawn out. It takes usually 10, 15 years. So if you can, like, as a politician and a political party, how do you manage this short-term and long-term sort of, you know, short-term incentive of actually winning elections, but at the same time, long-term benefit for the society? So, like, how does a political party think uh, in this perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, all over the world, this is a problem. 
Um, I think the professor explained it to me most uh, uh, simply was in the US and they said, listen, uh, developmental economics, if you are a growing country and you don't have, you know, uh, in, uh, kind of excess liquidity, you're scrambling. The simplest advice is take every spare dollar and put it into elementary education. That gives you the biggest bang for the buck relative to almost any other investment. That's still true. But the problem in a democracy is that for that investment to give returns will take you 15 years or 20 years for those people to grow up and reach the workforce. And you'll have to face three elections or four elections by then, depending on the country. And the public may not be as patient. And so, you know, most of us have to do this balancing act that we have to think about both the short term and the long term. I think most politicians try to do as best as they can. In fact, ironically, in 2016, um, when I um, well, gave my maiden speech, I said to then Chief Minister Ms. Jailta, I said, instead of keeping on reminding us 20 times a day that you have come back for a second five-year term after a 34-year gap that a, a government has been re-elected, why don't you do something about it and use the fact that you got a 10-year stretch, which almost nobody has had in 40 years, to actually think longer term? and do long-term kind of policies. Of course, you know, she, she uh, was not with us for very long. But certainly, uh, at least our chief minister, at least our plan, at least our manifesto, and uh, our internal uh, kind of uh, planning since we came is thinking longer term. So, for example, uh, much of my own departments, uh, the finance department, the human resource department, the planning development department, I am talking about a 10-year plan. You know, ideally we'll be around to execute it. If not, let somebody else come and pick it up. But uh, if you don't have at least a 10-year plan, it's very hard to go six months to one year to keep jumping. In Madurai Corporation, for example, uh, we have got a bunch of stakeholders together to start the process. Uh, and we want to come up with the Madurai City master plan. The last time a master plan was done for Madurai City was 1995. And so we want a master plan uh, for Madurai City and for about the 20 to 30 kilometer um, radius going outside of the city in terms of not just 2031, but 2041. We want a master plan for the next 20 years. And uh, we'll then start doing our projects within that plan. To be fair, Ms. Jalito also had a 10 year plan in 2013. She called it Vision 2023. Problem with master plans or long term plans is that if you miss the first few years of execution and targets, then they become irrelevant because you can't make up the gap because of the way compounding works. If you miss the first two or three years of the kind of growth rates that is supposed to hit, then you can't get to the goal in the next seven years because you'd need effectively. Let's take an example. Let's say that your plan calls for something like 13% a year. We have talked about one trillion economy in 10 years. We that requires about 13% of the a year. Uh, GSDP growth in nominal terms, meaning including the effect of inflation, which would be four, five percent, five and a half percent, at least in India. So you're looking at real growth of seven, eight percent, and then four, five percent inflation. So on the notional growth of 12, 13 percent, and you do that every year for 10 years, and you'll go from being about 300 billion now to a trillion in 10 years. But were we to lose the first three years and have only six or seven or five, then the remaining seven years we'd need something like 18 a year or 19 a year. And that becomes almost impossible. So uh, really, uh, though the long-term plans are important, even for long-term plans to be successful, you need to have the first part of the plan work right. Let's say the first three years we grow at 13, 14%. And then the one year it drops down to 10, and then we can make it up by 16, and then we can go back to 13 again. So it's drops of, Short amount, small amounts later in the cycle are easily recoverable. Large amounts or earlier in the cycle are not recoverable. And that's why we are so driven and focused to get in the right place now, using the bounce from the COVID, using the bounce from the lockdown uh, and return to economic activity. We're seeing that actually. Uh, you know, things like petrol usage uh, between the first week of, or the second, yeah, first two weeks of August and the first two weeks of September, Petrol consumption went up almost 35, 37%.
So we are seeing a return to economic activity that is of huge uh, proportions, at least in Tamil Nadu, because we did a lot of demand stimulation and we never let the economy go that far into recession. I'm not sure what it is for the rest of India, but we'll wait and see. Uh, Bhavya. Hi, sir. Good evening. Uh, so my question is that you had mentioned in an interview a few months back that your major concern is to maintain liquidity, right? And then that the main priority to be to focus on revenue, interest containment and debt containment. And additionally, to reduce the borrowing to finance interest payments, but rather pay more attention to capital development, right? So in the budget, which was presented for 2020-2021, the budgeted interest payments actually saw an increase as compared to the previous years. So amidst increasing interest payments and increasing focus on welfare schemes and also capital development, how does the government actually, like what measures do you think should be put into practice that can help a government maintain a balance between revenue, interest containment, debt, and to maintain like enough liquidity? Yeah, uh, let me make those simpler. I think the first is, I didn't say that I have a concern about liquidity. I said, when I came to the job, the first thing I did was ensure that I have liquidity and it's fine. You know, anyway, state governments are not like companies, right? You can't really run out of liquidity. There's so many places you can find money uh, to use in the short term. So I'm not saying we're flush with liquidity. I'm saying I just wanted to make sure that that was under control and it was, and then I moved on to other things. Uh, as for the second part, when you compare year over year budgets, you should never look at the numbers as numbers because you see there's the effect of inflation built in, there's the effect of GDP growth built in. So even if I am improving, for example, I have made a commitment that this year I will reduce the revenue deficit for the first time in seven years. Seven years in a row, the revenue deficit has gone up. Now, what does that mean? Even if the number were higher, as long as the increase was lower than the increase in the size of the economy or the size of the budget or inflation. That means I've still improved. In fact, I've gone one step further. I said I will actually bring down the revenue deficit in rupee terms, which means that I will have double improved it. Not only have I not grown as fast as GSDP or inflation or uh, the budget, but in today's rupees, I'm paying less than I was paying in yesterday's rupees, which were worth more than today's rupees because of inflation. Today's rupees are worth less than yesterday's rupees. So when you compare performance, absolute numbers become meaningless if you take uh, long periods of time. For example, the budget of Tamil Nadu today is about 355,000 crores. When I first came to be a, a MLA uh, in 2016, the budget was uh, uh, about 2 lakh crores. Right? So if I say what percentage uh, of uh, GSDP or what percentage of the budget, now I'm reasonable. If I say what was the absolute payment, then the numbers become uh, uh, confounded by inflation and by increase of the scale of the economy. So I would say that my focus is to reduce the revenue deficit because borrowing to invest is always a good thing as long as the law allows me to do it. In fact, it would be irresponsible to not borrow and invest. I've said it many times before that there is no better investor than the state itself, right? Because we borrow at the lowest rates possible compared to any other investor. We are guaranteed outcomes more than any other investor because the government doesn't do rent seeking on itself. There's the corruption will not stop a government project. And, uh, you know, basically uh, the, ba the, the, the barriers to successful outcomes are fewer. And we generally invest in such assets that they uh, have high multiplier effects. We build ports or water systems or hospitals or roads or you know things that will then create a great spurt in uh, economic activity or in productivity or in uh, you know uh, uh, people's ability to get to get to work. You know, they, so so we want to do capital. So I, really, my focus is that I want to reduce the revenue deficit. I want to, in, so I can do that two ways. I can increase the revenues and I can increase the revenues faster than the expenses and faster than the total size of the budget of the economy. Then as a percentage of GSDP, if I increase it, then it's even better, right? Because just increase means the GSDP is also growing. So I've had a very clear target. I said that one time we used to get about 10, 10 and a half percent of our GSDP as our revenues. That has dropped to seven, seven and a half before the pandemic and down to six, six and a half after the pandemic. So our ambition is to get back to 10, 10 and a half as quickly as possible. That is probably my primary goal. 
if i do that then i get the best of all worlds because my uh, uh, my revenue goes up faster than my denominator which is gsdp and also in return which is the interest as a percentage of revenues my revenues which is the denominator goes up faster than my interest payment goes up so my interest as a percentage of revenue drops so really i want to increase revenues fast as a percentage of gsdp therefore i want interest payments to drop as a percentage of revenues everything else will take care of itself but that and all i'm not that worried about everybody's debt is perpetually growing particularly if i include uh, no, you know the infl- effect of inflation uh, debt is always increasing very few t- even the us the only time i think in the in the last 50 years that the us paid back debt was under bill clinton uh, when i was in the us around uh, you know 15 years ago uh, under every type of government since then under republicans and democrats it has continuously kept on increasing right so that's what happens in most countries in fact the macroeconomic equation requires there to be people to borrow as long as the wealth of the world and the savings of individuals keep growing somebody must be on the other side borrowing it whether it's corporations or governments so you know those things don't worry me a lot it's really these two things revenues as a percentage of our economy and therefore bring down interest as a percentage of our revenues uh, we can do that multiple ways but the easiest way is to grow revenues fast and not borrow for revenue spending that's the two easiest ways to uh, to bring your economy back on track So we're doing both those yeah hello sir uh, do you think the aadhar infrastructure has the cap- capacity to help governments mitigate uh, inclusion and exclusion errors for <coughs> such subsidy schemes or do you think we need something else uh, it's a very good question uh, you know as with all things i have multiple levels of thinking about this one level is that i think uh, uh, the aadhar is better than nothing uh and we have used it in the last few uh, months as i told you for our initiatives quite a bit another level is to say the other database as many people have uh, proven uh, beyond a doubt has been compromised fundamentally and when i say compromised fundamentally i mean not that somebody who should be there is not there that is a fixable error but there are uh thousands and thousands of cases of people who don't exist or whose face and uh, you know retina and fingerprint don't match the name and the id so there's multiple fake records in the other database that's been proven beyond doubt now once you have some fake record it's like uh, pour- pouring uh, poison in the well because once i have the fear that just because your other retina scan checks out you're not really who you say you are because there's a fake entry in there then i got a problem that means it means nothing to me because you may still uh, uh, turn out to be somebody that i have no way of knowing because just because your scan or your fingerprint matches doesn't mean anything it could be a fakely inserted record that i've just validated validating a record means nothing there is one step beyond that which is that uh, you know the real cause of concern for us is very poor people and there's many problems with retina scanning and fingerprint scanning as you know you know especially if you're poor and work hard and you know your 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 fingerprints have been blurred and all that uh but the final concern i have is that the other database is a union government database though we can access it at some kind of micro level in reality reliance industries probably has better access to that database than the state of tamil nadu does <laughs> so these are things that we need to fix and in fact i have i've talked about this multiple times uh, niti aayog seems uh, sympathetic the, the union government at least some of the ministers i work with seem to understand so we need to come up with some kind of a data sharing uh, model between the states and the union of course while protecting individual privacy and so forth but um what we have right now does not work for us we need and you know other is better than anything else right now it is not by any means either full proof or uh, or the best uh, design um so uh, in like here you in terms of petrol and diesel cost you had to cut down the price of petrol uh, for diesel uh, you the price was not cut but what was chosen was uh, to provide subsidies uh so can you tell me what was the logic behind doing like this and what has been like the impact yeah you know um as i say it's really a question of targeting right what are you trying to achieve and uh, 
where can you afford to take the loss and what are the implications? Uh, I've talked about this a lot, so I don't want to spend too much time about it. But as I say on diesel, well, in everything, the biggest concern I have is I don't know who's buying what, right? Like if, if it was, let's say this was Singapore and the, every, every vehicle, every bike, every car, every bus, every truck has a unique ID, an RFID, a radio frequency ID that can be read by a scanner not that far different from the fast tag, okay? If I had that and I had the ability to tax discriminably, where I tell the petrol bank, uh, you get this kind of vehicle, you put this much uh, tax. You get that kind of vehicle, you put that much tax. You get, you know, a big SUV, you charge them plus 10 bucks above the current tax rate. You get a small car, you charge them five less. You get a... Uh, um, you know, a small business or a small farmer, a goods transport vehicle in charge. So that is really being able to target my subsidies to the people that I believe I want to help and reduce the income from them for the sake of societal good. Uh, since I don't have that luxury, I have to start looking for approximations. And the approximations that were available to us in the limited period of time and uh, the overwhelming urge of the chief minister that we had to fulfill as many pledged you know campaign promises as possible we just settled on that in the sense that petrol uh, very many fewer cars run on petrol and the greatest and even big trucks and all that don't run on petrol the greatest consumers of petrol by far are the 2.6 crore two wheelers in in Tamil Nadu and so that was a direct benefit that we thought would reach pretty much half the population, uh, you know, uh, instantaneously. And with diesel, it started getting a lot more complex about, you know, boats versus tractors versus public transport corporations versus large cargo carriers versus. And to be honest, uh, none of our economic advisors was a big buyer of the uh, fuel tax cut. And so, you know, uh, we did it uh, from the chief minister's perspective because he said, I said so and so I'll do it. Uh, I was sanguine. Uh, I liked a couple of things about it. One that I had personally stood up and argued against the VAT increase in the assembly when I was an opposition member, saying this is wrong to increase input costs and create likelihood of inflation or marginal squeeze of, uh, of uh, profit margins for fishermen, farmers. And all. So... I was happy to be consistent with my position that when I was in opposition, I argued against this increase and therefore I came and was part of bringing it back down. Uh, the second was that I genuinely felt there would be a multiplier effect in this one uh, because we were directly giving it to every individual. And that part has been proven true in the sense that when we take polling and so forth, the part that most people tell us uh, they really like was that we reduce the petrol tax. Uh, it's reached more people more effectively than any other subsidy or scheme that we have done. And partly, I think we wanted to show to the rest of the country that it can be done and we can live with it, right? I think like uh, the union, the RBI Monetary Policy Committee has been keeping on telling the union government for the last, I don't know, six months or a year that you really ought to reduce the taxes, the uh, union taxes on petrol and diesel, and that will give you a good multiplier effect on the economy. And they have been resisting. They have not done it at all. And so we thought, let us set an example. Let us show how good, the, you know, how big the multiplier effect will be. And let us get the debate. You know, as, as with everything, we want the debate to, uh, to expand. And we want more people talking about this. And I think we really achieved our limited objective, though I must confess that even the uh, day before yesterday, our economic advisors were not thrilled with it. So it is what it is. Sometimes we do things that are, uh, you know, for the people, even if they're not um, strictly by the textbook. Uh, we are completely run out of uh, time, but uh, Aryan Singh, you can go ahead with your question. Aryan. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, sir. So since you talked about your approach towards adopting a data-centric governance, but there's a case that often acquiring more data isn't going to make like uh, it's uh, data centric and may even make you less data centric. For example, if each data set you acquire has a different data model 
and you just like plop them in a data lake without any attempt to harmonize them then you are getting even then you are getting less and less data centric so and also following a data centric approach uh, an organization often fails to act as data driven so how is your government uh, coping up with the challenges while being a data centric and data based governance yeah I, i don't think we have any challenges at all right i run a large global operation where we use 100 times this with 1000 times the complexity so these are all basic steps that people have done you know tens of years ago we are far behind the curve I mean, there's no complexity it's like basic vanilla stuff right every every single step we take we get benefit and there's probably two or three years worth of improvements we'll make before we start wondering whether there's marginal cost of complexity or parallel or whatever it's a no brain we are so far back uh, these are all like uh, it's like being in kindergarten right? it is not is not complicated ashwin you can ask your question and with that we'll end it yeah uh, yes uh, thank you sir so good evening uh, you created and revamped the party's it cell for the campaign so it is nice to see your data driven politician as the finance minister Uh, so since you mentioned that we need to do better in terms of data availability what are some plans of the state of tamil nadu to bring people under the system to collect quality rich data while maintaining data privacy what is your suggestion on it so what was the word before something data what was the adjective there um in terms of data availability sir no oh, you said quality something... quality rich data Qual- quality rich data okay. better quality of data yeah well it turns out that the state actually has a lot of uh, records in different places some not digitized certainly not integrated certainly not cross referenced so before i ever ask for new information and worry about where the defining line on uh, on um, privacy versus uh, the greater good we still have miles to go i'll just give you an example in my constituency there are two like 40 something thousand voters uh by law i'm allowed to do two things i'm allowed to get the voter list otherwise as a candidate i would know who are my eligible voters and so every candidate who pays the deposit of 10000 rupees gets two sets of data at one time we would only get it in printed books now we get it in cds uh, some of us have better technology than others we can absorb that into uh, searchable sortable databases but these days data is available you know there's uh, the day i entered uh, uh elections in 2016 multiple people were trying to sell me so called other databases which i never took but um once you have this digitized data then the question is what do you do with it and then there's a second piece of information that everybody has whether they use or not which is that at the booth on the day of polling we are all allowed to have multiple agents who validate whether the voter who comes to vote is really the voter that they say they are and therefore that the booth is not rigged or captured or you know the the process is not subverted now when our agents sit in the booth of course they they tick off to prevent that person coming a second time you know let's say that somebody forgot to put ink on them at least we'll know this vote has already been cast or if some somehow a fake slip through when the next person comes saying i'm the real person at least we'll know there's a conflict here so you know um, because errors sometimes happen and they we only discover them retrospectively when the real person yeah, it's, it's hard to process you know a couple of like voters across 200 in this case because of covid almost 400 booths or 350 booths in 8 hours but most people don't take that data back and do anything with it so what i do and what many of the places that i can uh, aid the party to do we take that data back and we re-enter it into the computer so we know what has happened to voting patterns not just at the booth level or at a block level or at a ward level but at the individual level so for example i was shocked to find that between 2019 and 2021 though the overall uh, vote count the polled vote count only changed by about 2000 votes or less than that 1800 votes that really almost 30000 people who had voted in 2019 did not come to vote in 2021 some of them because they passed on or left madurai and shifted their vote to some other place but a significant portion of them 16 17000 people simply had not come to the booth who had come last time 
And then another 31,000 something people who had not voted in 2019, either because they did not live in Madurai then or they were not yet 18 years old, they were the old, you know, uh, below 18s, or people who uh, basically had stayed in Madurai, not bothered to come to vote in 2019 and had come in 2021. That was mind boggling to me, right? I mean, just think about it. When the overall vote count has changed only about 1,800 votes, who would have predicted that something like 23, 24% of the actual voters differed between last time and this time? It's not the same election at all. One in four voters is a different voter, right? So when we get that kind of data, we start saying, what is the point of analyzing last year to this year at a booth level, at a block level, at a ward level, at a constituency level? It's irrelevant. It's not even the same person. Only about 75% of the people are the same. And they probably don't change their vote. So one of the biggest things I learned from this is that when this old saying that people vote with their feet is actually true, very few people come, punch the lever for black this time and white next time. If they are enthused, they come and punch the vote. If they can, it can be enthused both ways, enthused by uh, a positive uh, desire or enthused by negative uh, kind of backlash. But they have to get worked up enough to come to, particularly in my constituency, because I don't pay for votes. I state the policy that I will not pay, and I don't pay that. And that's actually detrimental to turnout. Let's be very clear. Some people cannot afford to come to leave their day job or leave their day's earnings or not cook for their family or do whatever. In fact, democracy is not that even. Some people simply cannot afford to take the two or three hours out of their routine to come and vote. That's the reality of the world. It's much less so in urban areas than in Tamil Nadu, but it's true all over the country. So that means that uh, when you don't have enough incentive to come or when you have other costs that are built into the system, actually people come when they are motivated to vote rather than the other way around. They don't come and swing left, right, left, right. If they're not interested, they don't come, they don't care. And so when we realized this, we were really nervous. What does that mean? You know, if this, I mean, I, I do it for mine, I do it for a few, I don't do it for all 234. But if mine is typical, that means that the, the, this election has not, is not at all the same election as the last election. And therefore, we were nervous. Though we thought we were going to win, you know, in the going into the election, we thought that our 23 point something percent victory in 2019 was the best predictor, uh, most likely, you know, uh, estimator of highest likely estimator of the 2021 margin. But in fact, it was not. We won 2021 uh, uh, only by about five point something percent compared to the 23 percent we had won. In, and that's because the voters were changed. The, the voters were not enthusiastic about the ADMK, did not come last time. The voters who were very strongly against the BJP and uh, you know the leadership came out last time. The voters this time came out uh, as much about ADMK as they did about DMK, as much about caste, as much about other things. The, 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 the union government was not a factor in the elections nearly at all. Uh, and it was much more about other issues. And uh, in my case, by, by uh, you know good planning, good uh, execution for five years in MLA, whatever, my margin of victory actually rose from, you know, when the DMK won overall Tamil Nadu by uh, 23%. My constituency, my my uh, coalition partner, the CPM MP, only won by 20 or 21%. Highest of all the MLA constituencies in his MP, highest margin, highest vote share, uh, greatest improvement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but still only 20. This time, uh, all the other constituencies saw a decline. Uh, my margin went up to 23 or 24%, though the DMKs overall fell by five, and I won by 34,000 something votes without paying one rupee. That is what data does for you. That is what data analysis and planning your, your strategy and your execution and your campaign based on your understanding of what is happening does for you. So the data that exists even, uh, we are not using or we're not capturing and we're not putting it into a usable form. If that's true in politics, that's certainly true in government, right? Because in politics, this is our lifeblood. In government, we say, ah, you know, it's uh, somebody else's responsibility. This department is that department, somebody else. So, you know, uh, it's having an understanding. It's capturing it granular. It's understanding how to interpret it and analyze it. And then most of all, how to use what you have learned and, and how to create a strategy based on your learnings.
and it's and it's continuous, right? These, these none of these things are black and white. We we form a model. We think we understand. Then we try it out. Then we say, no, no, it's not quite that. It's something else. Then we can kind of get new data. Then we get another election. Then we put the data. So maybe we refine it this way. So we're continuously learning. You know, all these are inherently uh, non-deterministic models. Uh, they're evolving all the time, and our understanding, we hope, gets marginally better every time. Thank you, thank, thank you so much, sir. We have uh, completely run out of time. And uh, thank, you, please, thank you for being so patient and answering questions across a wide spectrum of uh, topics. Uh, it's been great. And we would like to give you off a virtual uh, send off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks all for listening in and good luck.